Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Perpetual Chess. This week's guest is a successful chess businessman, USCF chess master, former student of former guest GM Jesse Cry, uh, Adam Weisbarth, head of the Silver Knights Chess Academy. How's it going, Adam? Uh, it's going great, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Yeah, you've uh, you've built up quite a business in the Washington D.C. area. And Adam, just so you know, we've got about fifty five percent of our listeners in, are from the United States, so they may have heard of your organization. And if nothing else, they know how these chess organizations work. Uh, outside of the U.S., it may be slightly different. I know that each, as we talk about a lot on the podcast, uh, each uh, country has its own chess culture in their own way they do things, but. I'm sure there's some things that the U.S. could learn from other places and something that I think foreign, foreign listeners could learn from how we do things here. So hopefully this will be enlightening for everyone. But I know that uh, myself and the legions of chess teachers and chess professionals who listen will be very interested to hear all about your experiences building a business of how many teachers and how many schools, Adam? Uh, let's see. Right now, we probably have somewhere around 120 or 130 chess teachers, uh, and we teach in about 250 uh, elementary schools. Man, that is even that's even bigger than I thought. That just boggles my mind. Um, regular listeners will know I recently moved from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Princeton, New Jersey, and I teach chess as well and had like a small organization. So I just can't imagine getting to that scale. And I can't wait to dig in and hear how you pulled that off. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, and how old are you, Adam? Uh, I'm 37 right now. So I, I started uh, Silver Knights when I was, let's see, 25. So it's been about 12 years. Okay. And again, we'll get to the whole story. But just to give full credit, your brother is also pivotal in the organization as well, correct? Yeah, he is. He, so he's been uh, doing this with me um, since pretty close to the beginning um, okay. with, for about the last 10 years. Okay. And you also have Jeremy Kane high up helping you out. Shout out to supporter of the podcast, Jeremy Kane. Yep, absolutely. Jeremy's been here for a long time as well. I think um, more than seven years now. Wow. And a young man, but a senior master. Yep. Um, okay, so we'll get to all that. But I want to start with chess improvement, because your background is in chess teaching. Like I said, you're a strong player yourself. You've been a chess student. You've been a chess teacher. So uh, I don't even know how much teaching you still do with uh, an organization of that scale, but certainly you've put your time in. So what's your general philosophy for how uh, young motivated chess players should look to improve or old motivated chess players for that matter? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, it's true. I haven't done very much teaching the last few years, but before that, I did a ton. I mean, I've taught you know thousands of kids, um, and I, I think in some ways you really have to divide the the question up two ways. You know, one is for um, people that are really, really serious about chess. You know, kids that are ranked in the top ten, twenty, thirty, forty in the country, and things like that. And then there's um, sort of uh, everyone else, which is the you know the other ninety nine percent of us. Um, you know, personally for me, what has always worked the best is, um, and this is going to, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but opening videos, I, I really love, um, watching videos on openings. Um, and it seems silly because in this day and age, you can get information so much more quickly from a database or, uh, by just zooming through grandmaster games. If you, what you really want is to learn an opening. Um, but I've always found that I just retain information much better if I'm watching a little uh, 20 or 30 minute video on something. And so I may only see a small fraction of the possibilities, um, but I just retain it all and I really get the ideas. Um, you know, about, uh, I guess this was maybe 15 years ago when I was a much more active player and I wasn't a master yet, but I was trying to get there. Um, I played in the Washington State uh, Championship um, when I was in grad school in Seattle and it's a, it's a closed event with the top 10 players in the state. So, um, and it's a round Robin. So you play everybody once. And I was, uh, they invite the, like the top nine, uh, rated players in the state more or less and the top junior. And, 
I was the ninth rated player. I think the only player that I was rated higher than was the the kid. Right. Um, and I had a terrible first weekend to the tournament. I think I got a draw and three losses. And um, and then the next weekend, you know, and I was feeling very down. And um, but I had I just wanted to try something new. So I had seen these videos on the Bishop B five Sicilian, um, which at that time was maybe a little bit of a less known thing than it is now. And, uh, you know, they sort of spoke to me in some way. I really liked the position. So, you know, after watching an hour or two of videos on it, I figured I would give it a try. And I ended up uh, beating the guy who won the tournament, who was a 2400 something player. Um, and it was the only game he lost. Um, you know, he won seven and a half out of nine. And, um, so that was really fun and it kind of salvaged my tournament. So I, I guess, you know, for me, that's, what's always worked best. So I realized, so going back 15 years, one thing that strikes in thinking about this story is there were so many fewer chess videos now. I mean, now there's opening videos on everything under the sun, every, you know, chess.com, chess24, um, ICC, they all have amazing chess content. And then there's stuff you can actually, you know, purchase like, uh, like, Former guest uh, Grandmaster Eugene per- Palestine has launched Chess Openings Explained as like a subscription service, uh, and there's just great, uh, great opening content everywhere. But back then, I mean, it was you know you you might have had to cache the the video before you could watch the whole thing. And I remember the Gingy videos, uh, Roman Gingisvili was like a pioneer in the field and everyone loved his DVDs and he would come out with these DVDs in the early 2000s and then like the popularity of whatever he recommended would skyrocket. Um, but do you remember who made this video? Oh my gosh. I think it was uh, a maybe Murray Chandler, okay. uh, a British so- GM, I, I think, but boy, we're kind of go- going back a ways. It was called like bashing the Sicilian with Bishop B5 or something oh, like funny. that. Um, so, you know, I had to order the DVDs and I, I don't know, from England or something, and it was, but no, they were, they were like great. And of course now I'm sure all the lines that are recommended are just completely out of date. And, you know, I would, if I played anybody rated over 1800, that was like 10 years old or younger, they would just destroy me. Uh, but you know, I, I found that, uh, it was a very helpful way of retaining some of the, some of the ideas from the opening so that, you know, I could play the middle game well. Yeah, and it's um, you know, the the point you highlight about that being the way that you favor to learn. It's important to remember, both as a teacher and a student of the game, that like people have different learning methods. So while some people might have the the uh, facility with computers and software um, and the drive to just sit there with chess base and grind out memorizing the theory. For other people, they're better off just having a few things explained to them. And even if they don't remember all of the moves, at least they'll feel like they have a plan. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's not going to cut it against a grandmaster. But, you know, nothing you do is going to cut it against a grandmaster unless, you know, you get to that level. So how how dare you, Adam? I'm I'm so offended. (laughs) You're telling me I'm not going to watch a 15 minute video and go crush grandmasters? Well, senior masters, maybe once in a while. (laughs) Yeah, that's nice of you to say. But okay, so let's get into your your teaching as well. I mean, so that was helpful for your playing. Um, And what about so you mentioned there's obviously in your program, you you probably have a lot of fairly new students. What are your favorite resources for uh, newer students? Like you must provide some curriculum for your teachers. What what do you uh, provide? Yeah, we have about seven or eight different uh, semester long curriculum packets that we kind of match up with a each group at each school kind of depending on their age and skill level. Um, and you know, what we do is basically for the first about 20 minutes of the hour, we'll teach a lesson from our curriculum to the students. And then for the next 30 or 35 minutes, we break them up and they play what we call ladder games. And, you know, we're, we're pretty big on kids actually playing a lot of games. Um, so, you know, we definitely teach them stuff from a curriculum and they learn how do you checkmate with two rooks? How do you checkmate with a queen and a king? What's a fork? What's a pin? Um, play through some classic uh, Morphe games to learn, you know, a lot of cool tactics. Um, but, you know, I've always felt that kids learn best when they're given a lot of space to play games without somebody looking over their shoulder and correcting every little mistake they make. As long as they're making legal moves, sure. Well, yes, that there is that. <laughs> so for the first month or so with any uh, group of younger kids, you've got to watch out for that. Yeah. 
Um, okay, and did you make your curriculum? I did, yeah. Um, now, by this point in time, it's gone through some revisions uh, from other people uh, in our office. But yeah, in the beginning, I, I did basically just write it myself. Um, and I taught it a bunch of times. And, you know, I think one of the hard things about teaching chess in schools is that often you've got, um, you know, you might have a group of 20 kids to teach. And um, maybe 10 of them ha- are new and 10 of them have taken chess with you the semester prior. And, you know, one of the things that we've really had to put a lot of effort into when developing our curriculum is how do you teach both groups at once? Right. Yeah, that's uh, certainly a problem I've encountered frequently. And so what's, what do you, what tricks do you, have you developed? Well, um, you know, I think there's a few things that you can do. Um, you can build uh, a lot of questions into your lessons. So, you know, one of the things that we like to do is have our lessons be very heavy on um, the kids participating. So they have to learn how to name the squares right away, like the first or second week that they're in chess, because that gives them the ability to suggest moves to a teacher at a demo board. And without suggesting moves, they can't really participate. Um, so one of the, the the tricks that we've developed is you just build in a ton of questions to each lesson, and some of them are geared towards the beginner students, and some of them are geared towards the more advanced students. So even if um, some of the beginner students don't understand every single thing in the lesson, they still have a lot of opportunities to participate and learn. And the same with the students at the top of the group. You know, even if they, you know, some of what is being shown is stuff that they kind of know or take for granted, there's still some really challenging questions built in that will kind of stretch their understanding a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. And for that reason, yeah, when I have mixed groups, I often gravitate more towards showing games than presenting ideas because it's hard to present like a tactical theme at three different levels at once. But if you have games, you can show, you know, ask the easy questions to the beginner kids and the, or call on the beginner kids for the easier questions and the more advanced for the more advanced kids. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other great thing about showing a game is that there's often an entertaining story that goes with it. And kids really respond well to a good story. Yeah, uh, that's something I've really, I was aware of as an experienced teacher, but but my previous guest, Jay Stallings, has really, between reading his book and having him on the podcast, and he's going to be on again, um, along with some other great uh, chess presenters when we do our live event at the Elementary Nationals. Um, yeah, he's really helped me... Um, drive home that lesson and it's it's made the kids more responsive <laughs> and it's funny it's not even as a, as jay pointed out it doesn't you can embellish you know it doesn't have to be 100 percent true like who knows what happened in 1850 but but if the kids are entertained that's a win for all parties involved oh absolutely yeah i, I couldn't agree more um so you mentioned you told your story about learning from the youtube video but before we go any further do you have any favorite books if, from your your time as an improving player, our listeners always want, uh, they always like to hear what helped people uh, attain the level they attained. So uh, what what was most instrumental in your um, becoming a master? Um, that's a great question. So, I mean, to me, I, I was always just really interested in studying openings. Um, so, you know, I, I like to to buy opening books and just kind of play through them and see if the the lines seem interesting and fun. Um, I think that uh, probably, you know, again, I, I kind of was really studying a lot about 10 years ago, and that was, uh, I guess, 12 years ago now, and that was when I became a master. So uh, some of the stuff is probably a little bit out of date. But um, I really like to just buy a few different opening books on the same opening and kind of see how they interact and and um, learn different recommendations for uh, for similar positions and and things like that. Um, in in terms of specific books, honestly, the ones that I have the most practice with are Improvement for Kids. Um, so I really like. There's a book that came out a while ago by um, Dean Ippolito, who's an IM in uh, New Jersey that teaches chess. Um, it's called something like Chess Tactics for uh, for Scholastic Players. Yeah, and I like that book a lot. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, we always, you know, there's always, um, we've sold a lot of those at our tournaments. Um, and I think that, that that works well. It's like nice big print and, and really good progression of tactical ideas for kids. So I, I found that that helps kids a lot. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. And uh, it's presented nicely. Um, and yeah, can challenge kids for a long time. 
Um, okay, so one other thing before we get to the deep story of the growth of Silver Knights is uh, the chess world is a buzz because Fabiano Caruana will be in the world championship. So I thought it would be interesting to hear your perspective because I'm seeing a lot of discussions online about like, is this good for chess? Will chess grow? You know, does th- so <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, no one knows definitively the answer, but what's your perspective on how much something like that matters for the growth of chess and especially like your field, scholastic chess? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, I, I was thinking about that. I, I don't think there's any way to know. I mean, I think that if he actually wins and, you know, obviously he he's a pretty big underdog, but um, but he has a chance. And if he wins, I do think it's possible that it could sort of usher in um, a lot of popularity of of chess um, in the United States. You know, I, I don't know that there's any way it can really compare to the Fisher boom. Um because I think a lot of that was tied up in sort of the Cold War, and and um, so he was sort of perceived at that time as being something of a national hero, basically. Um, and you know, I don't know that that dynamic is necessarily in play uh, for Caruana now. But you know, if he really was able to take down Magnus Carlsen, I think that would be an amazing achievement. And um, you know, it, it, he would probably become much more well known here. And and I do think that. Um, it might kind of usher in a, an age of increased chess popularity in the in the United States, which w- which would be really cool. Yeah, it would be cool, and I feel like it's chess is already doing well here. So if it got even more wind at its back, that would be incredible. Um, but like you say, first of all, there's the narrative of the Cold War, which was you know that uh, a- added to the stakes and increased interest throughout the world. I mean, in this case with Magnus against Fabiano, it's sort of like a good guy against a good guy as far as I'm concerned. And the other thing that's different, of course, is the the diffusion of, of interest in medium or media available to people. So if whereas, you know, in 1972, if a world championship is shown on a network, people are going to be watching it almost whether they want to or not. Because they had four channels and they had no choice, basically. So they might, by accident, become super interested in chess. Whereas here, even if the story, even if someone becomes aware of the story, I mean, there's just so much competition for eyes and earbuds that it's not automatically going to capture a nation. Although with what's going on in Norway with the popularity of chess, uh, it does seem like actually winning is where we might see a tipping point rather than his just being in the match. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. You know, we've got, I guess, about three players in the top 10 right now. And um, that's really cool. And we didn't used to have that. Um, but but I, I think uh, I would probably agree that uh, if we actually get someone over the top to number one, maybe that'll move things a little bit here. Yeah, so stay tuned. I can't wait for November. And of course, it'll be a fun thing to present to chess students when it's happening as well. It always, you know, to to sports fans, like whatever the prize fund ends up being, I think it was around a million uh, two years ago. Um, to sports fans, that can sound like some people can be negative about it and say like, that doesn't sound that much. But when you tell a kid they're playing chess for a million dollars, that still gets their attention. So um, that alone gets their attention. And then just having the story unfold before their eyes is always fun. So we will we will see what happens. I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, there, there's no better story than uh, the world championship, and whatever happens, happens. So yeah, and it's I nice to right. have nice to have two good representatives. Um, yeah. Okay, so I want to get into the whole story of Silver Knights. We've got. I mean, I'm interested in all aspects of chess business, and I hope that other other chess fans are as well. I'm. I happen to be a teacher, so and uh, I'm in a new town. Full disclosure. So of course, I have some interest in stuff personally, like how to recruit schools and stuff like that. I don't have anything near the ambition of your organization. I just, you know, I just want schools for myself. And, you know, that's, that's my current level of ambition. Um, But anyway, I'm also interested in, you know, all the other aspects of chess, as we've talked about, we've got chess streamers, uh, chess um, announcers, uh, chess book publishers, like there's just so many aspects that I find interesting. And I'm generally interested in business. I read, uh, the book Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, where he talks about how he used to sell sneakers out of his car at the beginnings of, of Nike. And he basically just started from there and built this behemoth corporation. To me, that story is I- intrinsically interesting. So you've got a smaller scale version, but what were your beginnings as a chess teacher, Adam? Well, you know, it was it was something that I always did. I mean, I, I remember being in 
being in elementary school and I like taught all my friends to play. And then we had a chess team at my elementary school. And in high school, I uh, taught at my brother's elementary school and, you know, got them to have a chess team. And so it was always something that I did for fun on the side. Uh, and it never really occurred to me as something that, you know, one could do as a job. Um, so after college, I uh, taught for a couple of years and then I went to grad school and did you, grad school, sorry, did you teach chess or you were a classroom teacher? Uh, no, I, it was, uh, I was a classroom teacher, um, uh, basically at a school for, uh, kids that had, uh, various kinds of mental, um, issues or basically any kind of problem that was severe enough that they couldn't go to public school. So it was very small classes, um, very interesting and challenging and and fun. I found I, I really um, liked the kids and actually at that school I I um, got a little chess team going too. Kind of a bap- um, baptism by fire in terms of learning how to teach. Yeah, I mean, and I, it's funny because when I started doing it, I was expecting not to like it. You know, like oh, this is sort of the the job that I got, and you know, this is going to be hard. But actually, it was it was great. I mean, the kids were really awesome and. Um, you know, people are different and they have different challenges and, you know, public school just, um, I mean, I think public school is great for, for most kids, but you know, some, some kids just have different challenges and abilities. And I just found it to be really fun to work with them, you know, one-on-one or in small groups. Um, and so after that, I, I kind of went back to grad school, um, and I didn't, I didn't really like it, I guess. It, it was not um, – I don't know. It just wasn't connecting with me in some way, and I was not seeing a career for myself in, that was going to come from it. What were you studying? Um, statistics. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So uh, I started out on the, the PhD track, and then I was kind of – you know, I said, all right, I'll just – I'll get a master's and then leave, but I didn't really know what I was going to do. And while I was there, um, I was kind of bumming around and, and getting through my coursework. Um, a friend of a friend uh, knew I liked playing chess, and he he was looking for a job, and he found an ad, um, a job ad that said that some elementary school was looking for a chess teacher. So he showed it to me, and I said, I don't know, that looks interesting. Um, so I started teaching chess at this elementary school, and I think I was making like $25 for each uh, one-hour class. Um but it was basically the most fun hour of my week every week and it was just kind of goofing around with these 13 kids and um, teaching them how to play chess and what are tactics and things like that. And basically, I just became really obsessed with it and um, I started thinking like if I was running the program rather than, you know, uh, then, then sort of working for someone else as a teacher – um, and I did it at 10 schools instead of one, I, I kind of wonder if I could make a living out of it. And so I just did a lot of research on the internet. Basically, I, uh, I found, um, another company that was sort of doing what I wanted to do. Uh, they were not in the Seattle area. Uh, but I, I left grad school and I, um, I moved to Arizona and I worked uh, at this other place for a year. Um, I just tried to pick pick the brain of every really awesome chess teacher that I could find there, and um, I really have to credit some of them with um, letting me kind of watch them teach a bunch of times, and you know, just letting me ask them a million questions about how they got so good at teaching chess. Um, and then I did a bunch more research um, towards the end of that year, and and I had to pick some place to go to start my business. Um, and I ended up picking Philadelphia. So I'm actually, uh, I started Silver Knights uh, not too far from where you are now. Um, and I picked it because there wasn't really anybody teaching chess in a lot of the schools there. I mean, there were some individuals that were teaching chess in a few schools, but it wasn't like all of the schools had an organization already teaching chess. Wow. So you were um, deliberate enough to look at a map and plot out schools and figure out the best place to live based on uh, what, where, where the de- you felt there would be demand. Yeah, I mean, and and in some ways, I, I think I was really lucky to have hit on this idea um, before sort of the next phase of my life, which was 
you know, marriage and kids and everything, because I never would have been able to do that. Um, you know, at this age I'm at now, you know, I had nothing else going on and it was like, if I wanted to move across the country twice in a one year span and, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that many people, except for uh, maybe my parents, thought this was a good idea. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I could do it if I wanted. Um, I was sort of unencumbered at that time. Uh, one thing that strikes strikes me as interesting is so this was two thousand and three or something. What year are we talking? Um, I guess I started it in two thousand six. Okay. Uh, because I feel like chess has exploded. You know, I spent some time away from chess, and chess school programs, from my estimation, exploded in that period, like from when you started in the like ensuing decade leading up to now. So it seems to me like you could have gone anywhere. Do you do you think that's the case, or do you think that it was really helpful that you went to the Philly area in particular? Uh, I, I actually don't think it can work anywhere. I, I think that um, I, I don't think that Philly ultimately was the absolute best choice, but uh, you know it was the best I could figure out at that time, and I, I don't think it would have worked anywhere. Um, you know, I, I my first choice was to just start teaching chess in Seattle, which was where I was living at the time. I decided to do this um, because that's where I was in school, but you know, there were a couple of organizations that were already teaching in a decent number of schools. And the population there, you know, it's Seattle's a, a, a real city, but it, it's not like it has the population of, of, you know, someplace like Philadelphia. Right. So if you have a couple different groups that are already teaching in 30, 40, 50 schools, and then there's sort of a sprinkling of, you know, individual chess teachers that are all teaching in between three and eight schools, you know, there, there may not be that much of a business opportunity there unless you're going to displace a bunch of existing people. Which, um, you know, most schools, if they've got somebody teaching chess that they like, like, why would they want to switch? You know, why right. would you even want them to switch? Yeah. So I, I really did feel that I had to go for an area with a, a very big population um, that did not already have some big chess organizations. And and another aspect of, of Philadelphia is that um, it has a lot of small school districts rather than a few big ones. And one of the issues that that I saw when I was doing research is that certain school districts, for sort of strange, arcane reasons, are much more hospitable to after-school programs than other school districts. And so if you're in an area where the districts, you know, are not particularly friendly to after-school programs, there's just not much you can do. You know, there's nobody teaching chess there because there's nobody teaching any after-school programs there. And it's not really an opportunity. Um... So what I would kind of figured about Philadelphia was that, you know, each town is its own little school district in southern New Jersey and in the Philadelphia suburbs. So I kind of figured that even if it didn't work in, you know, half the school districts for some reason or another, well, it'll work in the other half because they've all got different rules. And that was basically what happened. Interesting. That was a, a lot of foresight on your part. And was your plan right from the beginning, like, I'm going to build up this business and I'm going to have people working for me? Or was it like, I need a full time schedule? And, you know, not looking beyond that point. Uh, it was definitely that I wanted to build up a big, I mean, you know, big and chess quotes, terms, but, yeah, right, <laughs> big, big, grand, scaled for teaching chess uh, business. Um, and, you know, now I think that the um, the scale of my ambition has definitely changed over the years um, as, you know, I've gotten some experience and learned some lessons. But, um, yeah, I mean, by, by my second semester, I... I I had a couple people helping me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I always wanted to build it up. Okay. And once you – so you reach a point, you find schools. All right. Well, let's let's take it from the beginning. So how do you approach a school? Well, what I did in the beginning, I, I was living in Arizona at the time, and I, I didn't want to spend more than one year there because um, I thought I might sort of lose my nerve and not, you know, do it. So uh, the spring break of – of the year I was in Arizona, um, I got plane ticket to Philadelphia, um, and I decided that was going to be my week that I was going to get schools. And I called and emailed about a hundred schools. Wow. <laughs> um, I made up a flyer. I had gotten a business license or whatever, and um, four of them out of a hundred uh, actually responded to my <laughs> uh, inquiry. So I rented a car. I drove around and I met with uh, folks at those four schools and those became my first four schools for the next year. 
That's pretty good, though, to get four. I mean, it's 100 phone calls is the reason why, but but that's pretty good to just get four schools right off the bat. Yeah, and, and I mean, so the, the second phase of that was I actually moved there at the beginning of the summer, and I was kind of like, okay, this is good. I'm not at zero, which was, of course, my fear was I wouldn't get any. Um, but I said, like, I, I'm not even going to be able to pay my rent with four schools. Yeah. Um, and I had, like, a, a little bit of money saved up so I could, you know, exist over the summer without earning anything. But, you know, by the time the fall hit, I, I had to earn some money. Um, and four schools wasn't going to be enough. And I got some really awesome advice from uh, my uncle who told me at the beginning of that summer, um, you know, that that my time was – completely worthless that summer. He's like, you, you know, five years from now, you're going to have all these demands on your time. Right now, your time is literally worthless. Like, you <laughs> don't have anybody to pay you money to do anything. So you should just find any place you can where you can teach chess to kids for free and do that all summer. And maybe you'll get a couple other schools from that because maybe kids will like it and their parents will like it and they'll invite you into their schools. And um, that turned out to be amazing advice. So I taught uh, chess at... Um, a few libraries that summer for free. And I mean, they were huge groups. I mean, 40 or 50 kids at a time. Um, and I ended up getting about 12 more schools from that. So I started my first fall semester with 16 schools because of that. Okay. Wow. All right. That's incredible. But first you have to break it down. So are you doing primarily after school programs? Are you doing curriculum classes already too? How's, how's that divided because how can you how can you do 16 after schools uh no that's a really good question uh, i got very creative is the answer so uh i had five after school uh i had uh, a bunch before school so you know some schools start late enough in the day that you can teach from like eight to nine a.m uh there were a, f a couple of private schools that would um that would do a lunchtime class so i would go and do like a 45 minute class during lunch um, public schools, uh, I, I guess, you know, kind of have more rules around that kind of thing. Uh, but private schools, it's like if they want to do it, they can do it. Uh, and let's see, at one or two schools, I would teach like a two-hour class and, um, you know, some kids would, would come back later. And then I had a couple schools where I just taught in the evening. And, um, you know, those classes weren't quite as popular um, because – you know, parents, obviously, it's more convenient as a parent to just leave your child at school for an extra hour and then pick them up uh, than it is to, you know, pick them up at 3.30 and then come back at 5.30. Uh, but, you know, I had a few classes in the evening that were, you know, I got 10 or 15 more kids. And then I taught at night in a couple of community centers, you know, from 7 wow. to 8. So, I mean, it, it was, I mean, it was a crazy schedule. I was putting like a 1,000 miles a week on my car just driving around from, you know, school to school. And were you doing private lessons at all? Yep. I was teaching some private lessons then too, although not a ton um, because I didn't really have my evenings available. So I would teach a few on weekends, but that, that wasn't a big part of, the, of what I did. Okay. All right. So that's incredible. 16 schools already and you know different schedules. I mean, I've worked for some organizations where, like you say, they do lunchtime programs and, and early morning programs, but it, it can be a harder sell. So I, I'm impressed that, that you were able to to convince all these schools to just go with what you had available. Yeah. I mean, that was, um, you know, in some ways it was just, it was lucky. I think, um, you know, I, we, I got a lot of interest from those summer programs that I taught for free and it was, it was like pretty soon it was like, okay, I don't have any afternoon slots, you know, what else can we do? Yeah. And so some of that came through. And what about the payment model? So for, for people who aren't chess teachers and don't know, the the general framework sometimes chess classes at schools can be paid for by the PTO the parent uh, organization or they can be paid for by the school itself or they can be paid for by the parents like per lesson basically um so d which of these did you use at the beginning and which have you transitioned to over the I years mean, We've always just had the vast majority of the programs are paid for by the parents of the, the kids that want to participate. Um, I, I know, you know, there's different ways of doing things, but I, I haven't really found schools to be receptive to, um, you know, paying hundreds or thousands of dollars sort of out of some part of the school or PTA budget. 
Um, you know, once in a while you can find a grant for something or other. Um, I know there's groups that probably do that part more effectively than we do, but you know, our, our model has mostly been, um, that, that the families pay. And, you know, we, we do give a lot of scholarships as well, um, to kids that are on free or reduced lunch, uh, in public schools. Uh, but for the most part, you know, that's not, that's not paid for by anything. That's just sort of, we do it. Um, so it, it's always been pretty much the parents. Okay. Yeah. And part of the reason I, I was interested in having you on is we've had the, uh, when we had Jay Stallings on, we had a sort of representative of the, the nonprofit chess business model. And of course there are other guests that I'm looking forward to having on. They also have uh, successful chess nonprofits, but yours was yours is a for-profit model. So did you, did you ever consider going with a nonprofit model? Yeah. In the beginning I did, um, you know, honestly, a big part of the decision, there, there's a lot more paperwork. Right. And that was already the worst part of starting a business for Amen. me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, so I was like, oh, I could do less paperwork. Let's, you know, let's do that. Um, no, but I, there's also things that you give up in terms of control. And, um, you know, I, t- to be honest, I really wanted to have control over what I was offering. And I, I didn't want to, uh, I just, I had a, a vision for what I wanted to do and I wanted to just go do it. And so I think, a just a regular company was the simplest vehicle for that. Okay. Um, so, all right, you've got your business doing off to a great start in Philly. And how long did you stay in Philly? Uh, that was about, let me see, that was five years. Oh, okay. Longer than I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and why'd you move? Well, you know, we, uh, so we had grown, I don't remember how many schools we were in in Philly. It was uh, probably 70 some or something like that. And uh, my brother finished college uh, two years after I started the business. And he started um, at first just working for me um, as a teacher. And, um, you know, both of us were kind of interested in him being able to work for the business full time. But the business, it, it wasn't enough income in the Philadelphia area for it to be really a two person job. Um, so we kind of just talked it over and we said, hey, what, you know, why don't we just try to have you move somewhere else and we'll just try to set up another branch of this. And, uh, at that time I sort of had figured out some better, um, ways of evaluating markets than I had when I started. And so I picked, uh, Northern Virginia kind of outside of Washington DC as the best place to go. And, and basically, uh, I set him up with some schools and he moved down here to, uh, Fairfax County, Virginia and, uh, started teaching there. So and, if you don't mind saying, how did you select that, that region? I mean, I have some guesses, but. Right. Well, so I, I'm imagining your, you know, your, your, your guesses are, are correct in a lot of ways, which are probably high population. Um, you know, it's a, it's a relatively affluent area and, you know, with our model where, you know, the way that we earn our revenue and where we, the way we can pay our teachers and everything is that, that individual parents are paying, you know, what you basically need is a large population of people that are sort of middle to upper middle class or higher. Right. And so the Washington DC region has that. Now other regions have that too, um, actually including Philadelphia, but, uh, but also, you know, I found that most of the school districts here are very hospitable to after school programs. And did you know that at the time? I did. I, I, um, I had kind of done some research on that and there you know, part of the, the the tell is that there were some other programs that had very big chess clubs. And um, now another piece of why we looked at going here was that although there were a few programs that had some big chess clubs in the area, they they weren't that big. So, you know, there was going to be some, uh, you know, some of the schools already had a chess teacher or a group of chess teachers, but uh, there were a ton of schools that didn't. So okay. that was a big part of it too. Um, okay. And, uh, okay. So we've come to the point where I have a question from, uh, your fr- friend and former employee, Rob Lazorchek. Um, oh, yeah, cause, sure. <laughs> cause I, yeah, he, he gave me a little bit of Intel. I always like to, to do some research on, uh, on my 
guests, and he's a listener to and supporter of the podcast. So he said, Adam ended up selling the Philly company. I'm curious how you value a chess company for resale. Um, uh, there's more to it, but let's start with that. Sure. So yeah, so I did end up, I, I sold it in 2011, the, the part of the company that was in Philadelphia. Um, so the short answer is I didn't really do any of that. I, I used a, uh, a business broker to sell it. Um, and so that was very helpful to me because I didn't know any, anything about the business world really. You know, I, I had no background in that. I, I knew nothing. How, so, how'd you know to use a business broker? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I just started asking people, you know, okay. I had, a, I had an accountant cause you know, you have to have an accountant to do your taxes. So I kind of asked him, um, and I, I just, I don't know. I asked anybody that, that I knew and that I could find, you know, just how you go about something like that. Um, and so, you know, he, the, the broker would ba- basically kind of analyze the business and put a value on it and, and things like that. Okay. Um, so what did they tell you in terms of like, I mean, I, I know, like I used to read Inc. Magazine a little bit and there's some like, you know, f- framework they give about uh, like percentage of revenue or something, but I don't even remember what it is. Like, so how, how did you know what was a reasonable offer? Are you just, they, they were able to tell you? Well, yeah. So, I mean, I think I learned, I actually read, so things like Inc. Magazine a lot and a lot of business books in the early days too, um, to try and learn some of this stuff. Um, and it was funny because I, there was a Borders uh, bookstore like a mile from my apartment in Philadelphia. And so I would always go there and just sit in the, the comfy chairs and read business books. Um, of course, I didn't have any money to pay for the, so I, didn't, I never <laughs> bought anything. Uh, you know, even so, then, I feel like with all the in all those schools with with teachers working for you already, you should have been doing okay. Well, it's uh, you know, there's all you you always gotta uh, there's always more expenses as you grow. So, um, you know, teachers make more. There's insurance. There's you know this. There's that. Um, but uh, you know, the funny thing to me about that is that um, you know, Borders isn't even around anymore. So I never dreamed that you know my dinky little business would be around would outlast the, the right. books that I was reading it. <laughs> yeah. Although I guess, you know, the fact that uh, I and probably many other people were hanging out there and not, not read, not pa- paying anything. Yeah. Right. That's just part of their problem. Right. Um, but you know, so the, the, the best advice that I got about sort of valuing a, a really small business like that is that most small businesses are worth nothing. They, you can't sell them because they're not worth anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason is that they can't survive without the founder. So if, if I teach chess in, um, you know, if I'm teaching chess in eight or nine schools and I'm earning some money from that and I want to sell my business or move or something, there's not really anything to sell because my customers are personally connected to me. They're not connected to my business, and if I leave, they have no reason to to use the person that you know, quote unquote, bought my business. You know, they they might just use someone else. So then, what did that new person buy? Um, you know, they didn't really buy anything. So um, I, you know, one of the things that the broker told me is that you know, in a, in a strange way, the less connected I was personally to outcomes in the business and the more it could just run without me, the more it would be worth. And so I, I, you know, I went to a lot of effort to sort of build up my group of chess teachers and everything. And, um, I think that was forget about the value of anything. I mean, I think that was key to it having any non-zero value at all was the fact that I had a group of teachers that, you know, they were the face of, silver knights to schools you know a, a lot of the schools didn't really care who i was right so you were able to sell it <laughs> yep. long, okay and and did you feel like it was a decent i mean you don't have to say how much you sold it for but do you feel like it was a like with the benefit of hindsight do you feel like it was um representative of the sweat equity you put into it uh, yeah, it sold for about $10 million. <laughs> right. No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> no, uh, obviously nowhere near that much. Um, no, I, I was, I, I was pretty happy with it. And, um, 
um, you know, it was kind of at a point in my life when uh, we had been doing the business in Virginia for a couple years at that point. This was 2011. And the Virginia one was really doing well and it was growing a lot. And I, you know, my brother was kind of uh, teaching a lot of the classes, but also um, helping hire some other teachers. And, and I was sort of running a lot of the sort of behind the scenes stuff from Philadelphia. And it got to where I was just working like 80 hours a week. And I, I, there was nothing else in my life besides this. And it was like, I, I could earn more money if I did more work, but it's like, my life was just miserable. Um, you know, I couldn't take a day off at all, like ever. And, um, you know, I was spending most of my weekends in Virginia. I would just take the train down or drive down and then I would come back to Philadelphia late Sunday night and it was just all work all the time. And basically my, my then girlfriend, uh, now wife, you know, kind of sat me down and was like, all right, Adam, like, uh, this is great and all, but you know, what is your plan here? Um, well, at least you had a girlfriend. (laughs) I did, you know, although, uh, for many years at the start of the, the company, I didn't. And it, right. You know, I didn't have any time or um, whatever. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, we kind of sold that and uh, moved, moved down here and kind of my brother and I sort of um, decided to gamble on the D.C. part of the business as our future. Okay. And obviously it, it- – proved to be a wise decision although of course uh from from i still think i think you would have been fine in philly too but it does sound like you were spread pretty pretty thin um so one one angle i definitely want to explore is you guys also provide after school coding instruction uh teaching kids to program so when did that start so that started let's see i believe it has been we're coming up on about two years that we've been doing that. Um, and, and what percentage of your business is that at this point? That's a good question. Uh, it's about probably 30%. Wow, that's a lot already. Yeah, and I see it in in the schools that I've been in. Um, there's just overwhelming demand for coding and robotics in particular, uh, which, of course, makes sense. Um, so how, what was the genesis of uh, the idea to offer that as well? Well, you know, we had, we had been teaching chess for about 10 years and, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of an itch to try something new. And, um, I mean, a couple of people on, on staff here were, were pushing me to do this, to try not coding in particular, but just try something else. And, you know, that really gave me something to consider. And, you know, for me, like maybe the most rewarding or one of the most rewarding parts of doing this has been, that I can provide like a full-time job for a few other folks in our office. And so it was kind of a, you know, I want to keep them happy and, and interested and engaged. And, um, so we kind of really studied this, you know, we studied to have other companies that started out in, in any one area, chess or soccer or robotics or anything, tried to expand to others and, and has that worked. And, um, a lot of companies have tried, and it doesn't seem to work very well for most of them. So that that was kind of – that gave me a lot of pause. You know, It's like why would we be able to do this when most other people haven't been? Um, but we did you – know, we, we did a lot of research, and we decided to go for it. And um, my brother did this whole big uh, study of you know, what did schools of the you know, 200-plus schools that we were teaching chess in, what did they not have that they wanted? And – so coding obviously ended up being what we chose, but it was funny because our runner up was dance. Huh. You know, that seemed to be very, you know, people really wanted it. And there were huge groups of schools where we already taught chess and there was nobody doing dance. And ultimately the reason that we went with coding instead was, you know, we're, we're sort of picturing ourselves talking to the schools huh. and, you know, they're, you know, we want to, Oh yeah, you like our chess program while well, we've got coding now too. And you know, I'm picturing the, the school is like, yeah, that makes sense. You're, you're the nerd. So you can right. teach coding too. And we're picturing like, how are they going to react if we say we can teach dance? They're just going to be like, what? <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of how we chose uh, coding. So how did you get the data that this is what people wanted? Did you, did you pull your, your clientele or like look at look outside of your area or what? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, we talked to a lot of our schools and um, 
we kind of looked at what program schools already offered and which ones seemed to sell out. Um, so that was just a big part of it um, as well. Okay. And you mentioned your employees. So how, like, walk us through, I mean, walk us through the process of uh, when you initially started to have people work for you and what you do now. Like, are your employees salaried? Um, how do you find them? What's their chess experience level uh, or coding experience level? Uh, stuff stuff like that. Like, what, what guidelines do you have for, for that? And what advice could you give any uh, smaller growing business chess businesses. Sure. Uh, so we, I mean, we really have two um, groups of employees. There's a small group that work in our office, um, who are mostly either kind of full time uh, and salaried, or uh, part time but work a pretty significant number of hours. And that's about um, I don't know, fourteen or fifteen people. And then there's uh, about 180 that teach, um, it's about two thirds of them teach chess and the other third teach coding. Um, so for the, for the teaching staff, I mean, it's, it's really hard. I mean, that's probably the hardest single thing about doing this is, um, is finding good teachers, um, that aren't you. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was having a conversation with, um, a friend once who also, uh, you know, owns a business teaching chess. And he was saying like, if I could just clone myself 10 times, I'd be a millionaire. Right. And you know, it's, it's true. You know, you, you can't, as the owner of a business, you, whether, whether the business is tiny or medium or enormous, you know, you, it, it's hard to find people that, that, that will put their, um, you know, blood, sweat and tears into something the way that you do, um, which makes sense. And, and that's okay. Uh, but you know, I, I we do a lot to recruit teachers. I mean, one of the things that I've found is that, um, you know, you're really looking at a pretty small slice of the population in terms of people that are even sort of eligible to teach chess to kids because, you know, you've imagined this Venn diagram of, you know, okay, here's the whole population of this metro area. So you need people that um, want to work with kids, can play some chess, want to only work for an hour a day in the afternoon, they've got to have a car or reliable transportation, um, you know, you're, you're starting to narrow things down pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and and number four has, has been an issue for me. And like in, before I moved from Pittsburgh, I was reaching the point where I was thinking about uh, hiring other teachers. But yeah, the, the, the primary people I would look to hire probably didn't have cars. Uh, yeah, and that's a huge problem, right? So, um, you know, you're you're just dealing with a small slice of the population because you more or less have to have a car to drive around to different schools. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we found about hiring teachers is, you know, just in my experience, teaching ex teaching experience and teaching skill is a lot more important than chess skill. I thought that's where you were going. I agree. Yeah. Um, you know, and I like one of one of the things I, I say sometimes, and I think it's true, is that I think every single year that we've been in business, the average chess rating of our teachers has gone down and the average quality of our instruction has gone up. Right. Um, now, obviously, you know, the very – if you get someone who's a national master who's also a great teacher, like that's the best case scenario. And, of course, you know uh, – Gee, who who are the very best teachers are like that? Actually, Rob, who you mentioned before, who taught here for years, um, and is now kind of doing his own thing in in New Jersey. Like he was like that, you know. He he he's a real chess player, and he's I don't know eighteen hundred or something. But he's also just an awesome teacher. So, um, but but you know, since you you can't always have everything, um, with the caveat that obviously folks have to be good enough at chess that they actually have something to teach to the kids. Um, I, I've just found that r really being an effective teacher is by far the, the bigger part of that equation. Okay. So how do you find your 180 employees? Let's get back to the, the nuts and bolts. So do you advertise or recruit at colleges or? Yeah. I mean, we do a lot of things. We have a three person HR department in our office and that's basically all they do. So we do, um, we do everything. We advertise, we do recruit at colleges. Um, a big part of it that I found, um, is also just retention. 
you know, for a, for a little while when I started out, I kind of assumed that, you know, if I can't give people a lot of work over the summer, some number of them are just going to leave. And that makes sense. Um, but what I've learned is there's a lot of things that we can do to retain people better. And I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that, but, but I think it's true. Like we retained, um, about 80% of our teachers over last summer, um, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, I mean, that's, uh, that would translate to, I, I think, unless I math is way off here, about a five year average tenure for a typical teacher, which is good. I mean, that's better than the average that people stay in full-time jobs. Yeah. Days. Yeah. That, that's good. Um, so, okay. A couple of things. So, now with this HR department, I feel like it's probably not as relatable, but but what about when you were smaller? How did you initially find people? Um, mostly through chess circles. You know, okay. that was my first group of people was, you know, there are networks of people that are rated chess players and you're, you know, that was definitely the first thing. So you can, um, um, you know, there's like lists of USCF members um, above a certain rating and certain zip codes so you can reach out to them. Um, you know, just meeting people at chess clubs and things like that was sort of the first uh, wave of things. So what what would be your, the rating threshold in your opinion? Um, like, what do you think if someone's listening and they're, they feel like, uh, I, you know, I might be interested in teaching chess because these days in, you know, in the age of the gig economy and the, the side hustle economy, whether you're interested in doing it full time or you just think it would be fun to do once or twice a week. Like what what do you what level do you think someone needs to be uh, in? Oh, I don't think they have to be any. I mean, they have to they have to know how to play and know basic strategy. They don't have to be rated to be an effective teacher at all. They just have to yeah. be a good teacher. Yeah, I agree. So, Adam, another question that I I've heard other people who have chess businesses encounter is: Do you ever have uh, employees who you hire who in enjoy the work and say thanks for hiring me, but then try to basically have the school be their own instead of being under the umbrella of Silver Knights? Uh, I have not really had that issue. Um, you know, in the beginning, I was very worried about it, but I think that was kind of the wrong mindset in a lot of ways. Um, uh, because you know, when, when you're, when you're really worried about it, that's really front of mind for you. And I think it leads to having sort of a suspicious view of your own teachers. And, you know, I, I think what I've learned in in recent years is that you know basically people respond really well to just being treated well and being trusted and um so really our focus is on keeping our teachers as happy as possible here and I I think you know one of the reasons that we've been able to have such a popular program is by having teachers that are are better than what a school would find somewhere else. So, you know, we, we pay teachers pretty well. I mean, we pay, as far as I'm aware, you know, 20 or 25% more than um, any other comparable after school program pays on average. You know, we send um, aides to a lot of our chess classes as well, which I think makes the, the coach's job a lot more fun if you've got somebody there helping you. So what's, what's your student number threshold for, <clears throat> excuse me, for sending an aide? Uh, we don't have a firm threshold. Um, you know, our, our coaches have 12 chess sets, so, you know, they can't, they can't really take more than 24 or 25 kids per instructor. Uh, but you know, the threshold really depends, you know, the younger the kids are in the group, the more likely you are to need an aid. Um, the more experienced the teacher is, the less likely you are to need an aid. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it really depends, um, and there's a lot of uh, judgment calls involved, but we try to just do what's going to be best for that particular teacher and that particular group of kids. Okay. Um, and you, so, and what about hiring coding teachers? How do you do that? I mean, really it's the same thing. You know, we've got three people in our office and their, their entire job is to, you know, recruit and, um, pick the best people available and background check and train and, and all of that. Um, so it's, you know, it's just, it's basically just a big investment that we've made in trying to find the best teachers. Um, you know, I, I don't know, um, 
you know, I think it, it really is different depending on the, the scale of what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I think if you're, if you're trying to hire two or three people, uh, you know, you throw up a couple online ads and just see who you meet from that. Um, it's different if you're trying to hire a hundred, you know, then right. you really need something that's process driven and, and efficient and really has good quality control in place. Mm-hmm. And where are you now in terms of the business? Like, do you feel like it's approaching maturity or are you still like pedal to the metal? There's more we can do. Uh. Um, well, you know, right now, as far as chess goes, um, we're growing uh, almost every year, but much more slowly than we used to. Um, so with coding, there's a lot of growth that we can do. And we have a third program, which is going to be a robotics class that we're, we're currently, it's kind of in its uh, beta test this year, and we're in about 10 schools. And we're going to have that in a whole bunch of schools uh, this coming fall. So I, I do feel like there's a lot more that we can do. Um, you know, we'd like to, uh, we've got a fourth class sort of queued up behind the robotics one that will sort of be in development, um, during the 18, 19 year. Um, so, you know, I, I would really like to try and get more programs, um, going and, you know, see if we can basically do things, um, do things better than, than what else is out there and, and earn some business that way. That's incredible. So I imagine your the nature of your job has changed a lot over the years. Yeah, I think, and that's been really hard because, um, you know, I, the one thing I did know how to do going into this was teach chess to kids. So, uh, but I didn't really know anything else. And that's, it's been very hard because, um, you know, my job now has no resemblance to what it used to. And so I, I really have to be careful that I'm always trying to get better at what I do now. Um, and do you enjoy, excuse me, do you enjoy it as much as you did teaching? Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the time I do. Yeah. Okay. I thought the, you might, might say mo' money, mo' problems, but, uh, well, that that's true on some days, but uh, yeah. but you know, a lot of the time it's it's really it's really fun and interesting. Yeah, I can't imagine. And earlier, of course, I asked you, as I always do, our guests about chess books. But do you have any business books or business resources? I mean, it sounds like you've. I mean, obviously, there's nothing new under the sun. You're you're borrowing ideas from all fields, I'm sure, and generating some on your own. But do you have anything that was especially? Uh, formative for you in terms of figuring out all this stuff as you go? Um, not so much a book, but one, one thing that I did do pretty early on, which, um, um, which has been very helpful is I, I actually got a business coach, um, pretty, you know, like I said, pretty early, like when I was in my first couple of years in Philadelphia and it was like, I really had to scrape together the money to, to hire him. Um, but I found that that has allowed me to avoid some big mistakes that I might otherwise have made is just having someone to, um, run ideas by who can weed out my really terrible ideas before they, they get too much traction. Um, and you kind of encourage me to think about things in, in different ways. That that's really interesting, and to to circle back to a, a prior guest when I had a successful businessman, probably the second most successful guest I've had, with the exception of Rex Sinkfeld, was uh was uh, James Altucher, who recommended just getting a coach in anything you do, uh, which is something I noticed in my poker playing days. Like the best poker players hired coaches right away. The ones who achieved the most knew what they didn't know and accepted it, and were able to to, um, you know, accelerate the learning curve by not trying to figure out everything for themselves. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think like that's, you know, I mean, gosh, there's like a million things over the last 12 years that could have, um, you know, made the business go in one direction or another. But I, I think, you know, you have to know your own strengths and weaknesses, um, if you're going to do something like this. And, I think the biggest thing for me is to just try and figure out what I'm not good at and get a little bit better at it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of where the business is now, do you have any, uh, 
any questions you're grappling with currently? Like, what's what's your problem of the day in terms of uh, how, how to handle the business? Ooh, these are some good questions, Ben. Thanks. <laughs> um, my problem of the day, uh, I would say that um, software is a, is a, something that we're grappling with right now. Um, you know, software can do a lot of things for businesses, but one of the things that we struggle with is that, you know, we're not a big business in the grand scheme of things, you know, at all. Um, you know, I'm part of a, a small business group that's kind of like tries to offer peer to peer advice basically. And, you know, I have just about the smallest business in this group of small businesses, but in the after school space, we're basically the biggest business that I'm aware of that teaches after school enrichment. And the the bad part about that is that there's not really a template for how we can grow and there's not software that's designed for a business like us. You know, there's software that's designed for restaurants or uh colleges or schools um or other kinds of businesses, but there's not really any kind of software that's that's designed for somebody like us. And so, you know, we have some difficult choices to make about that in the next couple of years in, like, in terms like of what whether we you in, whether you invest in developing it yourself sort of thing. Or? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is, you know, it's uh, there it would be expensive to do that and it, it could have a really amazing result and it could just be a black hole of money that we don't get anything from. Right. And in terms of the the money that your company makes, like do you pay your do you pay yourself a salary at this point or how does how does it work in terms of uh structuring the business with you and, you know, your your other higher ups? Yeah, I mean, everybody in our office um that's full-time uh including uh me has a salary from the business. Yeah. And that, you know, that's been really key. You know, anything with this you know, we, we're teaching, I don't know, maybe between chess and coding, five or 6,000 kids a week. And, you know, you need a team of really invested people to manage that. And so, you know, for sure, having a group of people that are sort of salaried and have benefits, and this is kind of how they support themselves, and in some cases, their families, um, you know, just coming here every day, you know, very, very smart people working hard. Um, that's absolutely key to it. You know, there's no way this could happen without, you know, you mentioned Jeremy, who's definitely one of our core people and there there's others as well. And it just, you know, none of this works without, without all of them. Okay. Um, that's great. And I, I, you, you, you have kids now too, right? I do. Yeah. I have a four year old and a baby. So I like Mm. you, I am firmly in the, like early child uh, rearing stage of life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, don't have as much time as we're used to. So I guess you're not working 80-hour weeks anymore? No, I'm not. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm i trying to spend, you know, less less time working, and there's a lot of push and pull there for sure. Um, but, you know, it's living in this area, I think it, it's good for keeping everything in perspective. You know, there's a lot of military stuff in, in Northern Virginia and D.C. And so, you know, I, I've got we've got customers and, and employees here who've got like spouses in the military that are, you know, gone for months at a time. And it's like that kind of helps me put, you know, my stuff in perspective. It's like, you know everybody's got things that, that they struggle with and, and, and many people have the whole work life balance thing. They, they have much harder situations than I do. Yeah, definitely. It's a first world problem, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's your life. So you, you know, you have to figure out how to manage your time and it, you know, it's a challenge, I'm sure. Yep. A- absolutely. Cool. Well, Adam, I think I feel like we've we've covered the broad brush strokes of the Silver Knight story. I mean, I just find it incredible. I mean, it's the the scale to me is just is just mind boggling. The the size of the organization you've built in really not that much time. I mean, I know that, like you say, in in the broader business world, it's not that big. But I have enough experience, like with after school programs and stuff like that. That to me, it's just it's quite impressive. Well, thank you. It's it's funny, funny you say that. I mean, uh, one of the, the running jokes we've had here for a while is kind of in the early days, a few of my uh, employees, including 
uh, Jeremy, who, who you mentioned before, um, they they were joking, hey, can we come get Magnus Carlsen to come to one of our tournaments? And I said, sure. The, the minute we have 10,000 kids in a week that participate in our programs, we'll do that. Huh. And so they've actually remembered that. Uh-oh. And they're kind of keeping tabs on things as it increases. So uh, we're, we're certainly not there yet, uh, but uh, I'm getting a little bit worried because I have no idea how much – uh, Magnus would uh, charge or if he'd be willing to do it. And, um, you know, I could be in a little bit of trouble there. Well, um, well, maybe Fabiano will be champion by the, by the time it happens. You never know. Yeah, that's true. I don't know if the, I don't know if the agreement switches to whoever is the, the current world champion or, right. uh, or not. We'll have to, we'll have to see. Yeah. I mean, Magnus, Magnus does do some of those, not a ton of those appearances, but they do happen. So there, there must be a price, and a few, at least a few organizations are willing to meet it. So. Right. Well, we'll have to see. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Um, if anyone would like to reach you, Adam, is there a way that they can do so? I'm sure some, you know, whether someone's looking for work or advice. Um, oh, actually, before I get to that, I do want to do one sort of summary, if you don't mind. Sure. Like, if you could do like, say you could do like five step advice, whether it's someone who just graduated college and wants to get into the business of chess teaching or someone moving to a town, what would be like, you know, your most bullet point advice that you could give for how to make that happen? Uh, I would say talk to as many people as you can and be open to what they say. Uh, rather than, oh man, you have to listen to, you have to listen to, that's what's hard (laughs) rather than, um, you know, deciding on what you're going to do and then being inflexible. Um, and other than that, I think you just have to do it. You know, you have to, you have to be willing to, uh, to upend your life to some extent for, for a while, um, and just see where it takes you. Um, and, and maybe that goes along with listening to the advice you get. Um, but I think, you know, that's, um, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. And I think people without you giving, you know, point by point advice, just hearing that you made, you know, a hundred phone calls when you were approaching a town, when you were, uh, moving to a new area and planning out your business and that you chose the areas specifically based on the opportunities. I mean, one, one can infer what they should do based on, on that, even though there's a lot more chess programs than there used to be. Uh, there's still always opportunity. And uh, as, as we mentioned before with the world championship coming up and with, uh, you know, Rex Singfeld, uh, supporting chess, um, and with all the great work that the chess sites like chess.com and chess24 are mm. doing and, you know, Twitch streaming on and on and on, uh, there's there's ample opportunity. So, yeah, um, for sure. I think there, there are a lot of opportunities for people out there. And I, I think uh, I thought of one other uh, little piece of advice, which which would be to be clear to yourself about um, whether your goal is to get 10 schools that you're going to teach in or to um, – you know, build something bigger because you really want to go in different, you know, you, you want to do different things, um, depending on which of those paths you want to take and just, just be clear with yourself about what each one demands of you. Yeah. That's good advice for, for me personally, actually, uh, as, as I embark in a new town, um, Cool. Well, okay. So back to the question of, uh, if people can reach out to you, is there a way, uh, for, for them to reach you, Adam? Yeah, sure. So there's um, um, a contact on the Silver Knights website, which is skenrichment.com. Uh, there's a contact form, so you know people can always use that. Um, my email is uh, adam at skenrichment.com, so people can just reach out to me directly there um, as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And once again, uh, congratulations on your success. Um, uh, eager. Maybe we in a few years when you have your dance program in full swing, we, we can uh, have you back. So on. to speak. So to speak. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, hey, thanks for having me on. And, you know, congratulations for building up this this podcast. I think it's really cool. Oh, thanks. It's no silver nights. But yeah, I, I, I enjoy it. And I'm proud of it. Yeah, I think it's great. Cool. Well, thank you, Adam. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Special thanks goes out to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. Without the generous support of the chess community, Perpetual Chess would not exist in its current form. 
I would like to thank Adam Vrancools, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, James Bonastia, Jason Dunbar, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, Jen Shahadi, Jen Scream, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopalakrishnan, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passi, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randall Temple, Ricky Grahava, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, Tatyava Brahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Victor Vrankul, Zhao Cheng, and last but not least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. I'll catch you all next week.